Well, again, good evening. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Quincy, California. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Proverbs, chapter 2. Proverbs, chapter 2. Last week, we began a new study through the book of Proverbs. This book is part of the collection of poetic and wisdom literature found in your Bible. That includes Job, Psalms, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. And if, if most Christians, and I mentioned this last week, but I'll mention it again, if most Christians would read a chapter in Proverbs every day, every month, throughout their years, it's 31 chapters in Proverbs, so right? Just about enough to read a chapter every day of the month. But if most Christians would read a chapter a day, most of their problems would be solved. But sadly, many Christians don't read their Bibles, let alone read the book of Proverbs. So I want to encourage you, read your Bible. Amen? Amen. Be a student of the Word. Read the Word every day. Pray every day. Now Solomon wrote the bulk of these recorded Proverbs. That's why they're often referred to as the Proverbs of Solomon. He didn't write them all, but he wrote the bulk of them. But even that bulk of them, about 800, or a fraction of the 3,000 Proverbs that uh, Solomon was said to have written according to 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 32 and 34. Now the theme of the book of Proverbs is wisdom. The key verse is Proverbs 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord <clears throat> is the beginning of knowledge or wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and knowledge. Now, before we begin this evening, I want to again define wisdom for you. There's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is information. It's data. You see, it's just the raw stuff. Wisdom, however, is applied knowledge. It's what we do with the knowledge. It's what we do with the information. It's what we do with the data from God's Word, you see. You know, I mentioned this last week, but I'll mention it again also, but you may know by way of knowledge that if you step on the gas pedal, the car will move. That's information, you see. That's knowledge. But if you never apply that knowledge by actually stepping on the gas, you will never go anywhere. So these Proverbs are intended to get us going and going in the right direction. But we have to actually use these Proverbs. We need to apply them to our lives in order for them to do any good. It does us no good to know these things if we're not willing, you see, to do these things. Amen? Amen. So Proverbs are a literary form used to help us know and remember in a few short sentences how to apply God's wisdom to the practical areas of our life. The Spanish author uh, Cervantes said this. He said, a, a proverb is a short sentence based on long experience. See, it's a short sentence based on long experience. So turn with me if you're not already there in your Bibles to the book of Proverbs chapter 2 verses 1 through 5. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Now this chapter, which almost comprises one single sentence can be broken into four sections. Section one, the pursuit 
of wisdom. That's verses 1 through 5. Section 2, the benefit of wisdom. That's verses 6 through 9. Section 3 is the protection of wisdom. That's verses 10 through 19. And then section 4, the promise of wisdom. That's verses 20 through 22. Clearly, wisdom is the theme. But here in verses 1 through 5, Solomon continues to instruct his son. It's a father imparting life lessons to his son. And as the Word of God, our Heavenly Father is imparting life lessons to us. But as we will see, there must be a pursuit of wisdom, a pursuit of these life lessons in order for them to do us any good. Now, I'm pretty sure that Solomon was not a computer programmer. But back in the day, when I was a computer programmer, we would call this section the if-then-else clause. If a statement was true, then a result or action would take place, else some other result or action would take place, you see. That's an if-then-else clause. So Solomon begins by saying, my son, if you receive my words. You see, there must be a reception of these truths in order for the result at the end of this section to be true. So if you receive these words, then, then you see, you will understand the fear of the Lord and find knowledge. Else you won't. Else you won't, you see. And the words that we need to receive, by the way, are the words of God regarding the application of wisdom to our lives. So we need to hear these words, we need to receive them, and as we will see, we need to apply them to our lives. And and by the way, these words, if you're reading through Proverbs and you're reading the various Proverbs, they're not necessarily applicable to you today or in your immediate situation. It says here, it says, and treasure my commands within you. So the idea is that you put these things, these nuggets of golden truth in the treasure of your heart to be used at the appropriate time. It's like a savings account of God's wisdom, you see. You read these things, that may not necessarily apply to your life right now, but you know what? It might apply tomorrow or the next day or some years from now. And so you store those up. It says, treasure my commands within you. We also see here that this requires effort on our part. It doesn't happen by putting your Bible under your pillow at night and sleeping on it. Nor does it happen by putting your Bible on the shelf when you go home and just being in the same room with it. It happens by work. It happens by effort, by reading your Bible, meditating on its truths, and then applying those truths to your life. Wisdom, biblical wisdom, is not the product of laziness, you see. Biblical wisdom is not the product of laziness. It's the product of diligence. It says, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures. Look at, look at those key words for a moment. Incline, apply, cry out, lift up, seek, and search. These are all action words. Words that imply 
effort on our part. This kind of wisdom doesn't come to the lazy Christian, you see. It comes to the diligent. It comes to the workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, as God's word tells us. So in order to find God's wisdom, there must be a pursuit of that wisdom. In fact, it's compared to being a miner who seeks after treasure and silver. And if any of you have ever done any mining, you know it's hard work. But there's a reward. For instance, for those of you who uh, maybe go out as a hobby and pan for gold, there's always a potential for a nugget. Amen? In fact, that's probably what you're hoping for. That's why you're doing it, you see. You're hoping to find some color in your pan. So we mine God's word for those nuggets of wisdom, you see. But it takes, it takes some effort. It takes some work. Now look at the reward of wisdom. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. This then is the result of the pursuit of wisdom. It results in an intimate relationship with God. We begin to know God in a personal way. We read back in chapter 1, verse 7, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of wisdom, but that fools despise wisdom and instruction. So this is the starting point for knowing God. We have to know Him, and we get to know Him through His Word. Next, next Solomon moves on to the benefit of wisdom. Look with me now at verses 6 through 9. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the paths of justice and preserves the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity, and every good path. The first thing we see is that God wants to give wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. In fact, He has a storehouse of these things for those who want them. And for those who are diligent about seeking the Lord in His wisdom, there's a benefit. First, we read He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. So God has, through wisdom, provided for our protection. You see? God has, through wisdom, provided for our protection. And I know you've heard me say this many times, and I think I even said it last week. But God's laws, God's commands, are like holy guardrails on the road of life. They protect us and they keep us in the right lane. Otherwise, we would go over the edge and down the cliff and to our destruction. So he is a shield to those who walk uprightly. That's the first benefit of wisdom. The second is he guards the paths of justice. You see, God will be your defense and make sure in one sense, that you get a fair trial. I know this world is not always fair, but you can count on God giving you justice and a fair shake in the end. And I'm not talking about your salvation. That was purchased by Christ in full at the cross. What I'm talking about is when we stand as believers for rewards for our service down here on earth. He guards the paths of justice. God will be just with you. Third, he preserves the way of his saints. In other words, he will keep that which you have committed to him against that day. He will preserve the way of the saints. You see, you are already preserved for eternal life through Christ, and nothing can change that. He preserves the way of his saints. Then, then, you will understand 
righteousness, justice, equity, and every good path. The idea is that we need God's protection in order to properly understand wisdom and be protected from this world's wisdom. Or this, this <laughs> I'm sorry, be properly protected from, oh yeah, I did mean this world's wisdom. It made, made sense when I wrote it. It didn't make sense when I read it. Uh, we learned this last week or two weeks ago in the book of James that worldly wisdom is earthly, it's sensual, and it's demonic, right? That's worldly wisdom. God will protect us from worldly wisdom. Lastly, in this section, we read the phrase, every good path. And it refers to the ruts left by wagon wheels in the soft earth. In other words, God's wisdom, it benefits us, it protects us, and it leaves an indelible track in our lives that we can follow over and over again. You know, some of us get bad ruts in our lives, right? Bad habits in our lives from time to time. And somehow we got to change things, whether it's diet or discipline or whatever it is to get out of the rut, right? But God's Word can build good ruts, good tracks in our lives that we can follow time and time and time again. But that only happens by way of the wagon wheel running over the same track time and time and time again. So allow God's Word, you see, to run tracks in your life and stay in that rut, as it were, with the Lord. How many of you know, I'll tell you a little story here, but how many of you know why the space shuttle is the size that it is? Well, when they first started transporting the space shuttle, right? It's before they started flying it on the back of 747s, they moved it on trains. And the trains were a certain size. And so the shuttle had to fit on the train. Now, when they first made trains, they used the jigs that came from wagons because they already had them. So the train was the width of a wagon jig, you see? And the wagons were made the size that they were made because the Romans rode their two-horse chariots all over Europe and dug these giant tracks. And if you didn't stay in the track, your wagon wheels broke, you see? So the space shuttle is the size that it is because of the Roman chariot. That's a rut. <laughs> you see? That's a rut. So develop good ruts in your life, biblical ruts in your life, and you can always depend on being on the right track. Amen? Yes. Don't go off track. Next, in verses 10 through 22, we're going to see the protection of wisdom. And, and this section can be broken into three parts. In verses 10 and 11, there is a general statement regarding the protection of wisdom. In verses 12 through 15, we have the first of two examples and in this one, wisdom protects us from the wicked man, the, the man who speaks perverse things. And the second example, verses 16 through 22, wisdom protects us from the immoral woman. But first, we have the general protection of wisdom stated. Look with me at verses 10 and 11. When wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, discretion will preserve you understanding will keep you so when we receive wisdom and apply it to our lives it does more than enter our heads as knowledge wisdom enters your heart in other words it becomes a part of your innermost being and when it does you want more of it knowledge when applied becomes wisdom and it becomes pleasant you see to your soul it satisfies your innermost man. So as Solomon said, and I'm paraphrasing here, in all you're getting, get wisdom. In all you're getting, get wisdom. And as you get wisdom, it protects you. It says here, 
Discretion will preserve you. Understanding will keep you, you see. Now we have two examples. The first one is the perverse, the man who speaks perverse things. Look with me at verses 12 through 15. To deliver you from the way of evil, from the man who speaks perverse things, from those who leave the paths of righteousness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perversity of the wicked, whose ways are crooked and who are devious in their paths. Now in the first chapter of Proverbs, Solomon warned his son not to run with the wrong crowd. Here in this chapter, Solomon admonishes his son that wisdom will protect him from running with the wrong crowd. And here we have a description of a man from that crowd. Notice he speaks perverse things. So his evil way begins with what he says, how he speaks. And then it moves on to what he does. It says from those who leave the paths of righteousness to walk in the ways of darkness. They turn away from the right road and begin to walk down the wrong road, the road without the light of God's word and wisdom. It's darkness, you see, plain and simple. When you leave the path of righteousness, when you turn off of God's road, you're going down the road of darkness, plain and simple. And you need the light of God's word to again show you the right path. How many of you know the power went out last night, right? Any of you go out of your house? Well, I'm out in the shed studying when the power goes out. It's about 11 o'clock or so. It is pitch black out there. I mean, pitch black. And, and the lights were on. Now they're off. So now I don't have any night vision, right? And it's dark. And it's pouring rain. And it's thundering and lightning. So I, I walk out the door of the shed and I'm standing on the stoop. And I'm looking around, hoping that my eyes adjust and it's all black. There are no stars, no moon. No, I'm, and I'm, in my mind I'm thinking, I wonder if Diane's up. I wonder if she'll get a flashlight and come look for me. In a few mi moments, I hear the screen door open and it's Diane standing on the porch with a flashlight. And I said, help. <laughs> we need the light of God's word to get back on track. Amen. If we've left the path of righteousness and are walking in darkness, we need the light. Amen? Plain and simple. You know, the wicked even rejoice in what they, they think. It says, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perversity of the wicked. So wisdom will protect you from these kinds of people and from being led down the same path that they are on. You see? Wisdom will protect you from that. And, and, and it will say to you, I mean, how many of you know, and, and most of you probably know this because it happens to you, I know it happened to me a lot when I was a brand new believer. I got saved, right? And I was just coming out of the world, into Christ. I still had a whole lot of the old world with me. And whenever I had a thought to go out and do something I shouldn't have done, right? God would put up a holy stop sign, right? I'd be walking down the street, maybe going to do something I ought not to do. And I would there on the, on the road, parked, would be a car, with a Christian bumper sticker. I would read it, hang my head, and go home. God will protect you. God's wisdom will protect you like that. He puts up stop signs along the way to preserve you and to protect you from the wicked. Now in the next example, wisdom will protect you from the immoral woman. And ladies, while well, this is the example because Solomon is speaking to his son. Wisdom will also protect you from the immoral man. It goes both ways. 
Look with me at verses 16 through 19. To deliver you from the immoral woman, from the seductress who flatters with her words, who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. For her house leads down to death and her paths to the dead. None who go to her return, nor do they regain the paths of life. So in this example, the immoral woman is an adulteress. She is not faithful in her own marriage. And she attempts to lure you into unfaithfulness as well. And notice how this begins. I want you to take notice. It says she flatters with her words. She flatters with her words. Beware of those men and women. It might be in the workplace. It might be in some place you frequent. It might be in some social group that you're a part of. Beware of those men and women that begin to pay undue attention to you even though they know you are married. Their intentions are not always honorable. Their goal is oftentimes to seduce you. And I want to mention this because that's an area where Satan can take an advantage in our lives. If you don't take care of the relationship in your own marriage, to love and cherish one another, to respect, then Satan might just send somebody, you see, to say all the right things, to flatter with their words. And all of a sudden, what you don't think you're getting at home, you're getting somewhere else. And it will lure you in. It will rope you in to sin. So don't give Satan anything to work with. Amen? Amen. Keep your marriage strong. Don't give the devil a foot in your life. Well, in this example, not only has the immoral woman left her own husband, it says the companion of her youth, but she also forgets the covenant of her God. And this, by the way, is an example in Scripture that marriage is both a religious and civil covenant. It's a dual covenant arrangement that involves both God and God-ordained government. You are not married, you see, without proper civil marriage accepted by the government. It's in the sight of God and the government. And I've, I've run into people over the years, well, we're married in the sight of God. Well, how's that going to work with your spouse when you die? Is she going to be able to get your Social Security? No. <laughs> Why is that? Because it's not legally accepted by government. Now, don't forget... God has ordained government for the well-being of man, right? And the punishment of evildoers. And so marriage is a dual covenant relationship between God and between civil authority that God, by the way, has ordained. And lastly, in this example, look where all of this leads to. Look where the immoral woman or the immoral man will lead to. It says, for her house leads down to death. Notice you're not going up. Amen? Amen. Down to death. And her paths to the dead. None who go to her return, nor do they regain the paths of life. What leads to destruction? Now this doesn't mean that you can't repent, you can't recover, but I assure you, both the repentance and the recovery are difficult when there has been a situation of adultery. Trust is broken, and it's hard to regain that trust. But wisdom will protect us from making this mistake. And that wisdom says, wisdom cries out, in other words, don't do it. <laughs> don't go there. It leads to death. 
it leads to destruction. Wisdom cries out. Listen to her. Amen? Listen to her. Now look at verses 20 through 22 for a, a final contrast between the upright who follow God's wisdom and the wicked who do not. This final section is called the promise of wisdom. So you may walk in the way of goodness and keep to the paths of righteousness for the upright will dwell in the land and the blameless will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the earth and the unfaithful will be uprooted from it. So the end result of the man or woman who will follow after God and his wisdom is that God will keep them. God will keep them. And as Solomon is speaking to his son, who is an Israelite, this had particular application to the law of God. If the Jews were faithful to keep God's laws, God would bless them and they would dwell in the land, you see. However, if the Jews were unfaithful, then they would be cut off from the earth and be uprooted from it. So remain faithful, you dwell in the land and remain in it, be unfaithful, and you will be cut off from the earth and be uprooted from it. And we can be sure, even though we aren't of the children of Israel, at least most of us, some of us might be, but we can be sure as well that if we apply God's wisdom to our lives, we will be blessed. Conversely, if we refuse God's wisdom, we will not. It's really as simple as that. And what greater wisdom is there than that we should turn our lives over to Christ and follow him. Amen? Amen. We read this in 1 Corinthians 1.24. It says that Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ is is the power of God and the wisdom of God. In one sense, all of God's wisdom is summed up in Christ. So in conclusion, we must pursue wisdom. God's wisdom that comes from His Word. And when we do, we begin to benefit, you see, from that wisdom. And one of the chief benefits of that wisdom is that that wisdom will protect us from making bad decisions and running with the wrong crowd. Amen? And I don't know about you, and I mentioned this last week, but I've read the book of Proverbs many times in my 46 years as a Christian. But I need to read it again and again and again and again to make it a regular habit. I find that I'm a leaky vessel. The good goes in, but some of it leaks out. I need to refill from time to time, and I'll bet you do too. So I, again, I want to encourage you, come, be filled again each and every Wednesday as we study God's wisdom together. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's have the worship team come back up and... Uh, Men, I want to remind you that this coming Saturday is men's breakfast. If you haven't already signed up, sign up at the credenza. Heavenly Father, once again, we, we're just in awe of your wisdom. Things that you speak to us, the things that you have put in your word for us to encourage us, to, to protect us, Lord, on this path, to keep us on this path so that we might not stray and that we might not sin against you. Thank you for your word, Lord, and thank you for what you've done through your word in our hearts and lives tonight. And I pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen, Amen. Amen. amen.